Good morning, church. This morning we are up to, um, in the telling of Jesus' story that we go through every year, we are up to the baptism of Jesus. We've made it through Advent where we focus on the anticipation of God's faithful people in those long, dark years before Jesus came, that time between the making of the promise and the keeping of the promise, and how we can be, how we should be a people of anticipation and faithfulness who learn to wait on God as well. We've been through Christmas now, where we celebrate the coming of Jesus and all that means for the world, which is a message that uh, in times like these we could use quite a bit of, and uh, we could be a blessing to the broader world if we embody that message. And now we are in the season of Epiphany, and Epiphany, of course, is um, sort of unveiling, a contextualizing, a making known. If you have an Epiphany, it's like a eureka moment given to you by God. God is revealing who Jesus is. And last week we started with the wise men, uh, the pagan sorcerers who came to worship him, and some of the things that that might have to say about who God is. And this week we come to his baptism. And every year when we go through the story, one of the other features that um, we always do is we pick one of the Gospels along with this ancient preaching plan called the lectionary. Uh, we pick one of the Gospels and we emphasize mostly on it, not exclusively on it as we go through the story of Jesus, oftentimes interspersed with text from the Gospel of John and occasionally Old Testament text, text from the other New Testament. Our Gospel for this year is the Gospel of Mark. And so really today marks the beginning of our exploration, this season for the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark doesn't say anything about the birth of Jesus, so we've been focused on other things up to this point, primarily in the Old Testament through the season of Advent. So now we're getting into Mark. And so today the baptism of Jesus serves in a way kind of as an introduction to Mark because it serves as a moment to reflect on Mark's introduction to his Gospel. And one of the things, and we're going to read some of that introduction in a minute, but one of the things that we want to say from the very first, and we want to kind of keep it in our mind as we go through this season talking about the life of Jesus through the Gospel of Mark, is that Mark from the very beginning is um, up front in putting his tables on the, or his cards on the table rather, about what is going on. Mark is, for all intents and purposes, writing to Christians who already know the story of Jesus, writing to people, it would seem, uh, as some scholars, and we'll talk about this more as we go, have suggested, writing to the church. And he's not trying to convince them that Jesus is the Son of God. He's asking them rather to wrestle with what it means to follow the Son of God, who Jesus is and what it means for Jesus to be um, what he has claimed to be. And so all of that kind of begins here in the beginning where John or Mark rather does not bury the lead he does not keep us in suspense he doesn't make us wait he just goes ahead and tells us up front uh, without playing around what is going on and so what I want to do is I want to start reading in verse 1 of Mark chapter 1 and I want to go down a ways through the story of Jesus baptism and then we can talk about this for just a few minutes this morning uh, this is Mark chapter 1 starting in verse 1 the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it is written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you, and he will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. And John was in the wilderness, calling people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. And John wore clothes made of camel's hair and a, with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locust and wild honey. He announced, One stronger than I am is coming after me, and I am not worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. And while he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open, and the Spirit, like a dove, coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I dearly love, and in you I find happiness. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. 
And so I just want to kind of spend a few moments this morning reflecting on this story as we introduce Mark's gospel. Again, Mark doesn't leave us in suspense as to what is going on. He says from the very beginning that this is, uh, much like the other gospel writers do in their own ways, this is a story about Jesus who is the Christ. And it starts, he says, with this uh, contextualization. He's going to draw in from the very beginning this text from Isaiah to explain who John the Baptist is. And it just reinforces this point that he wants to drive, that he wants to make clear from the very beginning, that everybody that's reading this likely already knows because he is, um, again, not trying to convince us that Jesus is the Christ. He's asking us as people who have already pledged allegiance to Jesus, what it means to follow Jesus. And so he draws in this passage from Isaiah, uh, this passage from Isaiah about how when God comes as king, and this is set against the failures and the inadequacies and the ineptitudes of earthly kings, the ways that they have gotten it wrong, he, um, he says that when God comes as king, there will be going before him a messenger whose job is to make paths straight, to fill up holes and valleys, to level mountains, to prepare the way of the Lord. But the important thing in Isaiah is that when this messenger comes, it's a sign that God is coming as king. God is the one who's going to set things right. God is the one who is coming to, to do what we have failed to do, to establish, for instance, righteousness in the face of unrighteousness, or justice in the face of injustice, or peace in the face of violence, or healing in the face of brokenness, or light in the place of darkness. God is coming to do this, and when the messenger comes, that's what we know is coming. That is the next step. And so Mark introduces John the Baptist as this messenger. You guys read the story in Isaiah, and this is what's happening with John the Baptist. And John, in Mark's story, has two basic elements to what he's doing. First is he's calling people to uh, repentance and the forgiveness of sins via baptism. He's baptizing people with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so he's calling people to repentance. That's the first thing. And um, I've been kind of thinking this is kind of uh, an important point for Mark. Mark is... Um, is going to be wrestling with us who think that we know Jesus, whether or not we really know him, whether or not we're really following him, whether or not the way we live our lives and we talk about him and we, we act out our values is really faithful to his way of doing things. And so he begins with this, this message of repentance. And that might be a theme for the year. We focus on this notion of repentance because oftentimes in the church, I've said this before, but this is kind of one of those refrains we need to focus on. Uh, we are good at asking the world to repent. We're not so good at considering whether we need to repent ourselves. But this is where Mark starts. He gives us John, who is the forerunner of the Messiah, God coming as king. And he says to us that uh, John was bringing this message of repentance. And then the second thing that he talks about very briefly, we're just kind of hitting all of this fast this morning, is that uh, John preached about the one who was coming after him who would he talks about it in terms of baptism and water and baptism and spirit he talks about the one who comes after him who would reconnect us to the spirit and in the old testament language and what will go on to be the new testament language the language of faith the spirit is the source of life that when we were separated from God by our sins, we entered into a reality where the only possible outcome was death, that all roads led to the grave, but now we have been, through Jesus, reconnected to the Spirit. We have been given life, and so the question hangs for those of us who have received the Spirit. What are we going to do with it? Are we living by the Spirit? Are we reverting to old ways of doing things? And so John comes into the story as the forerunner promised by Isaiah. The next step is that God would come as king, that God is going to start setting things right. And so John says to us in the church today, there are two things you want to consider. One is this matter of repentance. And two, this question that is hanging, if Jesus has given us the Spirit, are we honoring that gift of the Spirit that he has given? And then right after this, what we have next as we just go through the story, 
is uh, Jesus comes and he is baptized by John. And this is a complex story. There are a lot of things going on in this story. But um, what happens at the baptism, as reported by the gospel writers, gives us a clue as to how we should uh, at least start to read this and think about this. When Jesus goes down, down, down into the water and he is baptized, and in their world, baptism was uh, not an explicitly religious thing or an explicitly Jewish thing or an explicitly Christian thing, obviously, at this point. It was, it was a ceremonial thing that marked new beginnings. It marked the end of one thing and the beginning of something else. Perhaps it was a purification, the end of all of those impurities, the beginning of a new purity, or it marked the beginning of a, of a mission, the end of an old phase of life and the beginning of a new phase of life. So Jesus was baptized. He in, in, is induced into this new beginning. And as he comes out of the water, this voice comes from the heavens. The heavens are kind of ripped open um, it says, which is, is language that is reminiscent to passages in Isaiah where Isaiah cries out for God to, to tear the heaven, heavens open and reveal himself. The, the heavens are, are ripped open and a dove descends on Jesus, which is the spirit, the text says. And this voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And for someone to be declared the son of God, in the ancient world. For someone to be declared God's son, particularly in a Jewish context, was a way of saying, this is my king. This is the royalty that I choose. And so what's going on in the baptism as Jesus is anointed with the spirit, this, the dove descends on him. He's anointed by the spirit descending on him in the form of a dove. Messiah, the Christ, those are, are terms for the king that are translate to the, the anointed one. You anoint kings. As the voice declares, this is my son, the son of God in whom I have pleased, we get to focus on the fact that this is the chapter in which God chooses Jesus as the one to carry forth his purposes in the world. And we want to think about that for just a few minutes. God says, I choose Jesus, and we're going to see this in a variety of places through the gospel. We'll see this, for instance, later on in the Mount of Transfiguration, where they uh, go up on the mountain, Jesus and a few of his disciples, and up there he meets with Elijah and Moses, and um, Jesus is transfigured, he is transformed, and uh, he is uh, glowing with the glory of God. And Peter says, this is a great thing. We should build a temple or a tabernacle for all three of these to mark this momentous occasion. And the heavenly voice says, this is my son. Hear him. Again, repeating this language, I choose Jesus. And that's important for us to listen to these days. It ties back into that repentance. It ties back into that spirit and what are we doing with the Spirit. It ties back into this theme that Mark is going to confront us with again and again and again as we engage with what um, the New Testament scholar Tim Gombas calls his ungospel. His ungospel because he's not trying to convince us that Jesus is the Christ. He's trying to confront us with whether or not we actually believe Jesus is the Christ. God chose Jesus. That is what his baptism is about. This is the one I choose. It is through this one that I'm going to bring righteousness into the world of unrighteousness. It's through this one that I'm going to bring justice into the world of injustice. It's through this one that I'm going to bring healing into a world of woundedness. It is through this one that I'm going to bring joy into the midst of sorrow. It's through this one that I'm going to bring you know, violent or violence to an end and bring peace about in a world that is accustomed to war. It's through this one that I'm going to bring light into the midst of darkness. It is through Jesus. He is the one that the prophets have been talking about, that the poets have been looking for. He is the one through which I am going to make things right. And we need to hear that. We need to hear that and we need to take up those questions that John asks at the coming of Jesus. Do we need to repent? Are we taking advantage of the life? Are we living faithfully into the life that Jesus brings by bringing us the Spirit, plugging us back in to the source of life in God? Or are we, in a variety of ways, continuing on with um, the various ways that we have adopted death as a normal way of life? Are we following Jesus? 
Or do we give lip service to Jesus in our songs and our prayers and at the communion table and our sermons and our scripture readings and our moments of worship on Sunday morning or private devotion as we take quiet time and then actually give our day-to-day on-the-ground allegiance to other ways? Do our lives demonstrate the this is my guidance that God declares in the baptism of Jesus? Because we have all sorts of competing voices in our world And this week perhaps is a week where that's more clear than than any other time. Where there are political alternatives to Jesus and there are economic alternatives to Jesus and there are cultural alternatives to Jesus. There are all sorts of ways that we suppose we can address the problems of the world, real or imagined, other than following in the way of Jesus. But John hits us up front. I don't want to play around here. You need to know who Jesus is. You already know who Jesus is. The question is, are you going to follow him? Do you need to repent? Are you plugged into life? Or are you still living in death? So the question that he's going to confront us with as we go through, because I think uh, part of the problem, part of the temptation is that at this early stage before John or before Mark rather starts unpack what it means to follow Jesus all of us would say well of course I follow Jesus of course we have adopted the way of Jesus of course we are plugged into life rather than death but then again we live in a nation where all sorts of people this very week have done all sorts of horrible things in the name of Jesus where we in millions of ways still live in the story of of fear and accusation and power all the while declaring Jesus is Lord. All the while declaring that Jesus is the one that we follow, all the while presuming to enjoy the benefits of being connected to the Spirit through Jesus. And so Mark is going to say, sure, you say you follow Jesus. And don't think I'm picking on you. He's looking at Rob Sparks and saying, sure, Rob, you presume that you follow Jesus. You say you do. But what we're going to do in my gospel is we're going to ask the question, do you really follow Jesus? Or are you more concerned with being progressive or conservative or blue or or red or theologically traditional or theologically liberal? Are you more concerned with being rich because that's the way forward or some other way of doing things? Do you take up the way of fear and accusation and power? It says there are broken things in the world, things that ought not be scary things, and the way to fix them is to get power over them and take care of them that way. That way we don't have to be afraid of them anymore. Do you take up that way in the millions of ways that that story plays out in the world, or are you really following Jesus? Mark wants to hold out the possibility that we can very realistically say Jesus is Lord but live our lives in a different way and he's going to ask us are you really following Jesus and as we go through the story of Jesus this is one of the reasons why we do it we want to pray to God and we will pray to God here in just a minute that he remove all of the debris all of the things that fog our vision all of the things that block us from seeing Jesus as he is so we can follow Jesus as he is not as we suppose him to be Not some other God in the form of Jesus, but actually follow Jesus. So the declaration comes in Mark's gospel from the very beginning. This is my son. This is the one I choose. And so it's going to foster a season of repentance. He wants to reconnect you with the life of the spirit where all we have known is death. But we have to ask, are we really willing to follow Jesus or are we going to hold on to stubbornly all those old ways of doing life? Let's go ahead and pray and then um, we will let you guys go after we remember who we are. Father, we come to you in this season of Epiphany and we ask for clarity of vision and understanding as we seek to know who Jesus is. We pray that you would give us the humility to consider that we too may need to repent. We pray that you would give us the courage to repent where it becomes obvious that we should. We pray that you would give us clarity of vision, that you would move aside all the obstacles, clear out all the debris, 
push aside all of the things that keep us from seeing Jesus clearly. And that we would focus on the glory of who he is and what he has brought in the world. God, may we be more like Jesus. And we come to you now and we pray as a family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now forever. Amen. Let's remember who we are as we go into God's world. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, we love you and we miss you. We look forward to seeing you again, but we are pulling for you way over here. Can't wait till we can um, pull for you face to face. Y'all have a great week.